Hello, CCDA. You know, in the movie, Chariots of Fire, the main character is a young Christian who would later go on to live and minister and die on the mission field in China. But now he was a runner, a young runner. And at one point in the film he said, when I run, I can feel God's pleasure. When I watch those young women dance and worship, and when I see all of you this, you are a mosaic of God's children, gathered because you love God's poorest children. Tonight, I can just feel God's pleasure. And somehow you reminded me of that film tonight. I've been here before, and I'm glad to be back here again. You are led by a Christian leader who I have more respect for than most Christian leaders in the whole world. <laughs> we were reminiscing tonight, John Perkins, we go back, we go back, when he was a young man, and I was almost a boy. It's a long time ago. And I know, and I'm hearing about his Bible studies, you know, how packed they are and how amazing they are. There you are. And I know, John, I know we're both evangelicals, but John Perkins, you are like good wine. You get better and better with age. And Barbara William Skinner and Mary Nelson, they're both on my board, and I sat between them in my board meeting last week. Boy, that's a way to keep out of trouble right there, right between those two powerful women of God. I knew I was under the control of the Holy Spirit or something <laughs> during that time. And you're led now by Noel Castellanos, who is somebody I, is becoming a dear and trusted colleague and ally and co-worker in many venues, and he was the one who came to me just a few years ago, and because he had learned that you can't just keep dealing with the symptoms of injustice and depression, can't keep pulling bodies out of the river all day long and not go upstream to see what or who is throwing them in, he said, Jim, I challenge you to put comprehensive immigration reform on your agenda. And we have, thanks to you. Thanks to you. Tonight, I want to talk about, you know, synergy. And how what you do every day, 24-7, is part of, of choices, decisions that you make but the thousands and millions, and those choices are connecting to change. How our choices make change, I want to talk about tonight. I love CCDA because I think that what you do every day really has made the gospel more credible in this country. Because we have suffered, we have suffered in this country because of sometimes a witness that undermines our integrity and our evangelistic power. Remember the first time I was on the John Stewart Daily Show, the place where like most Americans under 30 get their news from the Daily Show, then all the networks combine, you know? And, and I got these emails afterwards from thousands of young people who, who wrote me and said, I didn't know you could be a Christian and care about poverty. But then they see you, and they watch you, and they hear from you, and you are helping to restore our integrity <laughs> and our credibility. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard to be in the most forgotten places with the most forgotten people. There you are, and here you are, and, 
And I speak tonight as Sojourners, as a member of CCDA. So we're part of the family, you're part of us, and we're part of you. And I'm glad to be here, especially because this morning when I finished with the students at University of Wisconsin, I got to the airport and my flight was canceled because it was raining really hard. They said, well, I'll, we'll get you to Cincinnati by 9 o'clock. <laughs> so Tim and I got in the car and jumped in the car and drove through the rain to Chicago and got a plane and made it here on time. <laughs> Thanks be to God. And despite all the travel, as Eric said, I do like to go home a lot, get back fast. Got these two little boys, Luke's 11 and Jack is six, and I, I have to be home every weekend because I coach both the Little League baseball teams. We got some big games this weekend, but mostly I like to be home. Part of why I like to be home is because my job is to do the prayers at night, and I don't like to miss the prayers because they move me and they shape me and they sometimes make me laugh. So I thought I'd start with sharing a little few of Jack's prayers. He, <laughs> Jack was, was praying the other night and he said, uh, God, thank you for my mom, my dad, and for my brother, and my friends and cousins, and, and I pray for all the poor and, and homeless and hungry people, and God, do you know there really are a lot of poor and hungry and homeless people? Any comments or questions? <laughs> Lee Jackson, one of those interactive classrooms, you know. And then last week he said, Lord, thank you for my brother and my mom and my dad and my cousins and all the homeless people. Poor people. And Lord, I pray for all those people who don't have who don't have, I pray for all those who don't have life insurance. <laughs> and he finished, I said, Jack, do you mean health insurance? Oh yeah, I knew it was one of those things. He said. <laughs> you can tell what's going on in, in my house these days. Um, the other night he prayed at the end, and God, please make me a chess master. <laughs> I got a call the other day from a, from a filmmaker, a young filmmaker named Morgan Spurlock. He's done Super Size Me and some other pretty interesting films about the fast food industry and other So as he turns out to be, he's a seeker. He's, I think he's... He's kind of open, you know, open to our message, and he's kind of hungry, and, and, he, he, and he likes Sojourners, and he was, he's got the special, doing the special. He's doing the 20th anniversary special for Fox on The Simpsons, their 20th anniversary. And he wanted a religious leader's comments on the religious aspects of The Simpsons. <laughs> now, I'm not an avid watcher, but most of my staff is. And they offered to work overtime and showing me videos and getting me ready and it's called they're sacrificing for the Lord, you know. And so, so I watched this song, but, but I, I was struck by the prayers of young Bart Simpson. I guess I like prayers of little kids. Who got to his knees and he prayed for a snow day so he could pass his history test with one more day of study. Or that God would return his soul somehow because he'd sold it off. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then there's a lot of theological issues I saw in this thing. Like big theological questions. Can God microwave a burrito to be so hot that even he can't eat it? Uh, is it a sin to mouth obscenities if you don't make any sound? If I... T t if I told a really good joke, would it make God laugh? Uh, wouldn't eternal bliss get boring after a while? I mean, it's really heavy stuff. But then I watched this, you know, the evangelical is Ned Flanders. You, you only know this show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I watched this episode where Ned is like stalking poor Homer in the car. He's trying to, you know, witness to him and bring him to the Lord by stalking him in the car, holding up a sign and everything. It didn't work really well. But in the same episode, Ned pulls Homer out of a burning house at the risk of his own life 
he sacrificed his life to save his neighbor. And that brought Homer back to church. The message was clear. Don't just talk about it all the time. Do it. Do it. And that's what you all do. And that's why I'm just blessed to be here. You ask the hard questions. How can we be Jesus Christ with some skin in the game? In the most forgotten places, with the most forgotten people. It's not a question you ask just at a conference, or once or twice. It's a question that has to shape your whole life. Day after day, year after year, they define our faith. They, they help us to work out our faith with fear and trembling. That's what the scriptures say we're supposed to do. And we're supposed to be talking about the topic of partnership. So I noticed that Barbara William Skinner and Soon Cha Ra talked about subversion. I'm going to get the tape. I was at Madison last night, but I'm going to get that tape. Tomorrow night you'll hear from Bart Campolo, Alexia Salvatieri, these are all dear friends of mine, about solidarity. And then Matthew Watts and Shane Claiborne about simplicity, and finally John Perkins about symphony. That's great. He's about the best orchestra conductor I've ever met, so that's a good topic for John. But tonight I'm supposed to talk, like Gabe did, about synergy, a concept which quite simply means it teaches us that no matter what you learned in school, one plus one does not equal two. One plus one does not equal two. I've always liked the concept of synergy because it reminds me of the resurrection. It doesn't seem to add up or make sense. The resurrection tells us that the foundation of the universe is not cause and effect, but cross and resurrection. That's what we believe, you and I. Sacrifice and forgiveness, grace in the midst of violence. Synergy teaches us that when different forces are brought together in cooperation, their total effects are greater together than they are apart. That what I bring to the table and what you bring to the table gets greater than the sum of its parts. A person of phages might say when in the middle of an economic crisis, when there's you know, the subprimes had gone down, the derivatives hadn't worked, and there's 5,000 people had to be fed, and then a lot of women and children, and the disciples said, Jesus, we can't do this. It's too big for us. It's beyond our scope. Send them home. The kid walks up and shares his lunch. Five loaves and two fishes. And there was enough, yeah. enough to fill baskets after. We say, it's a miracle. Yeah, yeah, it was. But why was the little boy in the story? Why didn't God just say, poof? Because the kid gave Jesus something to work with. Uh -huh. He shared his lunch. In a crisis, you want to hunker down, hang on to your lunch. But when you share your lunch, yeah. synergy happens, and with God, things tend to multiply. Multiply. How do we make synergy between prophetic faith, acting in neighborhoods, on blocks, locally, nationally, inside, outside, movements change, changing lives, and then even changing politics? Synergy. Now, I live in Washington, D.C. The dangers of government are nowhere more clear in the scriptures than in John's writing in Revelation 13. In the chapter, he declares what I believe is the Roman Empire as an evil and demonic beast, Babylon from the pits of hell. But in Paul, who in Acts 16, Paul actively 
exercises his rights as a Roman citizen. He describes government in Romans 13 as, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad, which you have no fear of authority, then do what is good, and you'll receive its approval. For it, it, it is, it is God's servant for your good. So what is it? God's servant, common good, or demonic agent, which is true, both. At its worst, destructive, demonic, as best, God's servant for the common good, preservation of order. I would say that in a country where, you know, they say that we have some democratic right to have some voice or say, maybe what we do has some say in which way this thing goes, one way or the other. Just about a year ago, we had an election in this country. I'm not sure if you noticed, it was in the news. Uh, <laughs> made the press a few times, hotly contested, inspiring for some, disturbing for others, divisive for some, unifying for others. Sincere people of faith voted differently for deeply held and legitimate reasons, and I'm quite certain that no matter how you cast your vote last November, no one's going to hell for how they voted. <laughs> but. When we had a mobilization and poverty in Washington, D.C., many of you were there last year, many of those who were there were quite excited about the election of the first African-American president of the United States, a younger man, new generation. They were excited. And I said to them early in the administration two things, two mistakes we can make. To believe that change has already come, or to believe that nothing could ever change at all. Both are mistakes. Barack Obama said when he won the election, if I'm going to change anything big, I'll need the wind of a movement at my back. I wrote him a note that very day. It said, yeah, and probably also at your front to clear the way and pull you along when necessary because presidents seem to need that. Many of you have heard me say that I believe God is personal, but never private. <laughs> personal, but never private. So we see in the scriptures the prophets thunder God's public concerns. They speak to rulers and princes and landlords and employers and judges. They speak on behalf of widows and orphans and workers and those left out and left behind. Their topics are familiar, land, labor, capital, equity, fairness, justice, public stuff, the stuff of politics. These are secular topics but with deep moral and biblical meaning. These are what the prophets speak to and about. And the church historians tell us that spiritual activity or conversion or renewal doesn't get to be called revival until it has changed something about the society. That's what they all say. So if faith cures your addictions and, 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 and heals your marriage and puts your life on a new path, praise the Lord. It's all good, but the historians say it isn't revival until it has changed something in the society. Public stuff. Faith is meant to change the world that God loves so much. I grew up in Detroit. I grew up in an evangelical home. My parents started that Plymouth Brethren Church, and they told me to love the Lord and that God loved me, and that was right and good. But then they said, it's all about you and the Lord, and that was wrong. It was about me and the Lord and Detroit and how, how, how we live so differently in white Detroit than how even Christians lived in black Detroit, just a few blocks and miles away. That was a gospel issue when they said, Jim, you got to understand, Christianity has nothing to do with racism. That's political, and our faith is personal. I, I left that night at 14 years of age. It seemed wrong to me, and so I left. I found my home, and the movements of my generation came back later, but I learned now that it's not just about me and the Lord. 
It's about me and the neighborhood and the nation and the world that God loves. I love Charles Finney, you know, the, the, the second great awakening preacher, the Billy Graham of his day. He used the altar call all the time. He kind of pioneered the concept before Billy Graham. He'd call people to faith in Jesus Christ and on the spot that very night sign them up for the anti-slavery campaign. On the spot. Come to Jesus and join God's purposes in the world. So I'm at Park Street Church in Boston, right? And I, and I get there, and I, went, I was told, I was on the book tour for this, the book I wrote about the Great Awakening, and they said, you know, Finney preached here in 1831 during the week. He had these altar calls, and these folks came, and the room that night was full of, the whole room was full of under 30 evangelicals who thought they were new abolitionists, who cared about the trafficking, of women and children in whom there is the image of God and they knew there are more sexual economic slaves today than there were when Wilberforce freed the slaves 200 years ago. A new generation, I could, I, I was, Barbara, I was just kind of tingling. I could feel the possibility of a whole new movement growing because of faith, because of faith. Public consequences for personal faith. You know, the movie about William Wilberforce, Amazing Grace, have you seen that? Great movie. But you know, it didn't, it didn't, it talked about the great man and Wesley and his faith and Wilberforce and how he got saved and gave his life to abolishing the slave trade. They put forward the bill nine times before it passed, and when it finally passed, Wilberforce died three days later because his work was done. They didn't talk about the movement like a prairie fire that swept the country and made Wilberforce possible. That's synergy. Synergy. We got some challenges. We got some chains that need loosing, mountains to move, ministry. We in this room, we love ministry. Our faith has been defined by ministry. Ministry is where we start. It's where we start. It's where we, it's where we, we find our faith again. But ministry can't by itself loosen the chains of injustice. The God of the Bible is not a God of charity. The God of the Bible is a God of justice, a God of justice. How do we move from ministry to a movement? It's called synergy. Budgets are moral documents. They talk about who and what's important, who and what we value. Family budget, church budget, state budget, a nation's budget. When Katrina hit, Government on all levels was missing in action. And who went? People of faith. I was at a church in Ohio preaching, and they have sent teams from that church to New Orleans and the Gulf Coast 47 times. One church. It's changed them. But you know what? As powerful as that is, churches can't rebuild levees. They can't do it. They can't provide health care for 47 million people. Homeless shelters are important. We've done them at Sojourners. Building houses for habitats is important, but now Habitat says we're not just going to build our way out of the housing crisis. We, as an organization, are now against poverty housing. Who has got more authority than Habitat for Humanity to talk about the nation's housing crisis? It's called leading by example. It's synergy. We can't loosen the chains of a lending crisis. More and more people in foreclosure. My brother works for a neighborhood organization in Detroit that serves the most. He runs this organization, serves the most vulnerable people there. My city has 30% unemployment in Detroit. And my brother's house, like so many others, their houses are now worth less 
than their mortgage. There's foreclosures everywhere. Where he runs a shelter, people are lying, literally lying on the street by the hundreds. It's like cities all over the world, but, you know, not here, they think. And yet, they're ministering, ministering, ministering all the time, and they're all getting tired and running out of steam. David Beckman of Bread for the World says that when they cut nutrition programs in Washington, D.C., by 1% or 2%, they wipe out the equivalent of all the feeding programs of all the congregations in America. Synergy. How do you lead from a neighborhood to a nation? That's the bad news. The good news, the Bible says, if you have faith the size of the grain of a mustard seed, what can you move? What? Mountain. What? Mountain. We, as the people of God, are in the mountain-moving business. That's what we do. That's who we are. Just as I learned that I can't limit God's intention to just changing my life, we can't limit God to just changing our neighborhood. God wants to change our nations, and God wants to change our world, and every choice we make helps build the synergy for a movement that does that very thing. Remember the last time I was here, we had an altar call at the end of the evening. I'm not planning one tonight, but you never know. We might get carried away. It was to come to Washington and witness in the midst of a budget crisis when the poor had been left out again and again and again. So 110 Christians came to a witness on Capitol Hill. I think half of them were from CCDA. Mary Nelson was there, Noel Castellanos was there, John Perkins was there, and they all got arrested. <laughs> Mary Nelson at the press conference said, as they're looking down from the windows, the Congress and staff, she said, come walk with us. Come meet the families whose nutrition programs you are about to cut. Come walk with us and meet the people who aren't going to have any health care anymore. Come meet the kids who thought they were going to college on Pell Grants and won't be able to now. Come walk with us. You must not know them or you wouldn't do this. We know them. Come walk with us. John Perkins preached the night before we went. And John told a story I'd never heard before. He talked about how his mother died when he was seven months old. And how in a conversation much later he was talking to his daughter and he said, you know, my mother died of a nutritional deficiency, malnutrition. I was breastfeeding, taking my mother's milk. And I realized that maybe I killed my mother. And his daughter said, no, no. You know, what killed your mother was being a sharecropper, was racist policies that didn't care in a white society about the nutrition of poor black women and their children. Policies and practices that made that unimportant. And so John said, so they're going to cut food stamps. They're going to cut nutrition. And I'm here to make my last stand. Fortunately, it wasn't his last stand. <laughs> but there were tears coming down our faces when he finished preaching, and we went, and we prayed, and we sang, and they came and handcuffed us, and the police very respectfully came up to John Perkins and handcuffed him. And we said, take him first, it's cold. <laughs> and there was a big smile on John Perkins' face. And I think that day made God smile. It's taking a stand. Because of what people were doing in their neighborhoods, they cared about their nation. Now, we've got some big fights. You know the Dow hit 10,000 10, this week. Did you see it? Wall Street is celebrating. We also hit 10% unemployment in the same week. We got banks and bailouts and bonuses, and somehow the poor are not being bailed out. You know, they don't like safety nets for the poor. 
but they gave a great big safety net to the richest people in the country. And you know, we shouldn't be silent about that. We're those... We are those who are not going to get into the weeds of partisan battles, which are all about politics, who wins, who loses. But we're going to say, we're going to hold both sides accountable to imperatives that for us are biblical imperatives. That's what we do. We're not going to go left or go right. We're going to go deeper. Go deeper. And hold both sides accountable to that moral issue right beneath the political debates. That's what we want to do. Last week I was invited among, with a number of faith leaders to talk to some senators about climate change. And they were talking about how they were for the environment. And we said that we were too. They said they were for green jobs. We said, you know, we are too because these green jobs could give meaningful work to a lot of uh, you know, uh, low-income, undereducated young people. This is, a ju this is a future for us. We're for this. But then I said, there's a fundamental moral problem here. The people around the world who have contributed least to climate change and global warming are the ones who will be affected the most. And first, our affluence is going to cause their suffering, and that is a sin. And the money that you've allocated to help them adapt to uh, mitigate those changes, the money you've adapted to that is pitiful. It is pitiful. These were democratic senators who thought they cared about the poor. It was pitiful. And unless you do better, unless you do better, you can't expect the support of people of faith. And they said, well, you know, we haven't got the votes. I said, I know the global poor are not on the agenda of domestic politics in this country, but they're on God's agenda, and they will be on our agenda, and you must do better. <laughs> we have got to do more than just care about what's in our neighborhood, and we've got to do more than just lobby them in Washington, D.C. These are false choices. If we don't start in the neighborhoods where you live and work, we will have no credibility whatsoever. But if we just kind of whisper in the ear of those in power, go to meetings, have a little bit of access, send some emails, tell them we're happy with the best that they can do. Then we'll show that we don't care about the big changes of systems and structures and policies and practices. We need to start in our neighborhoods and then go and not whisper but shout, let justice roll down like waters and right like an ever-flowing stream and you guys work out the plumbing. Synergy. Synergy. There are models, different biblical models for how to do this. I've been most comfortable in my life with the model of Amos and Isaiah and Jeremiah, the lonely prophet crying in the wilderness, rallying the people against the powers that be, a thorn in the side of those who would deny justice. But there's also Joseph. Joseph who saved his own family from starving during a famine and saved the people of Egypt because he and God had foresight in the agricultural public policy. Then Daniel who, who served the king that had conquered his people and exiled him and his friends, he gave them good advice. But when his, his faith was threatened, he was willing to be thrown into the lion's den to protect his faith, and his friends got thrown into a fiery furnace. There was Esther, who used her, her, her knowledge of the king in relation to protect her people. Uh, she, then there was, I, I'm le learning a lot from Nehemiah. Nehemiah had the ear of the king, but he knew the king was not going to rebuild the wall. So he was a community organizer. He mobilized the people. 
He organized, he gave them all jobs, and he knew that somehow the wall had to be built. He said, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, its gates are burned. He's been to your neighborhood. Come, let us rebuild the wall so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told him the hand of my God had been gracious upon me and also the words the king had spoken to me. Then he said, let us start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. Let's study Nehemiah. He may be a prophet for our time. When Martin Luther King Jr. won the Nobel Peace Prize, and th this, this guy deserved it, um, as the president himself has said, no doubt that Martin King deserved it. He came back, and he didn't go home to Atlanta. He went right to Washington to talk to Lyndon Johnson. And he said, now that we have a civil rights law, we need a Voting Rights Act. Johnson said, I, I, I'm sorry, I've cashed in all my chits with the Southern Senators. I've got no political capital left. I, I can't get you a Voting Rights Act. It'll take five or 10 years to do that. King said, we can't wait five or 10 years. Un unless we can vote in the South, we can't even enforce a civil rights law. We need voting rights now. Johnson, I'm sorry, it's not possible. He was the master of real politic, talking to the nation's moral leader. I can't do it, it'll take five or 10 years. So King, not one to whine or complain or withdraw, he was an organizer. He went to a small town in Alabama called Selma, uh -huh. and John Lewis, and a bunch of young people walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on a bloody Sunday. Young John Lewis, now congressman, got almost beaten to death. But the whole nation focused on Selma, and the clergy came down, and they marched from Selma to Montgomery, and the eyes of the nation watched what was happening. And in five months, we had a Voting Rights Act. Five months. King had changed the wind. He changed what was possible. He made new things possible. We can't be content with just working at the symptoms or just whispering our advice in Washington. We have to be not just service providers and not just lobbyists. We have to be the wind changers, those who change the wind and make new things possible because of synergy. Do you know why we got a Voting Rights Act and a Civil Rights Law? Because of choices made by thousands of people, millions of people, personal choices every day, like you make every day. Those laws don't change because there's some good lobbyist in town. There's a synergy, there's a movement, there's a spirit, there's a momentum when choices are made, tens, hundreds, thousands, and millions, those choices make changes, build synergy, and cause a movement. In movements, we have different roles, vocations, different gifts. All are needed to make a movement grow. But it's always the people on the ground, on the edges, on the fringes, with the forgotten people in the forgotten places. That's where the vision comes from, not in the corridors of power. Martin King learned how to navigate those corridors. His base was never in the corridors of power. It was in a movement, just like you, just like CCDA. Gandhi said, be the change you want for the world. Then he went and changed India. Tutu didn't stay in Soweto. He went to Cape Town and Pretoria because the system had to change and it took a movement. There are those who want to make false choices. We have to be those who lift up the synergy of a movement. I think We've got to be radical enough to go to the root causes and say it isn't enough to minister 
to the victims of the systems. We have to be the ones who go to the root. In this room tonight, there is Amos, there is Jeremiah, there is Isaiah, there is Joseph, there is Daniel, there is Nehemiah, there is, and you know there's, there's going to be women too in this thing, Esther, Deborah, Fannie Lou Hamer, Dorothy Day. You're all here. God's calling up a new generation of leaders for a new time such as this. Who will they be? God is calling us together to be the next John Perkins. And when he calls us together on Sunday to talk about symphony, pick your instrument, find your voice, choose the right note, and let the conductor conduct you in the music of a movement together. That's what CCDA can really be and really do. We close with a prayer and a story. My older son, Luke, he's 11, and when he was nine, he was praying one night, and you know, it's a wonderful thing to see children work out their struggles and their concerns in their prayer life. So Luke had been really impacted by this, the number of children under five who die every day because of preventable disease and what Bono calls stupid poverty. 25,000 today, yesterday, and tomorrow. So my nine-year-old son was praying and he said, dear God, I pray those children don't die again tomorrow. But that's unlikely. So dear God, I pray that it would be their best day ever. But that's stupid. Dear God, help us to stop this from happening. Help us to stop is from happening. Can we do it? I mean, it's too big. It's too much for us. Can, is our synergy powerful enough? Can we do it? Well, I've seen it. I'm old enough to have seen it. And I'll just finish with one time when I saw it. I had been snuck into South Africa during the worst time, the most difficult time. Nelson Mandela was in jail. Desmond Tutu, others been thrown in the jail, and they just come out and they ask for help. So a few of us were snuck in the country. I arrived on a morning and went to St. George's Cathedral, where a worship service was taking place. Outside, there are more police and military than I've ever seen before surrounding this cathedral. Three times as many who were inside worshiping. They were there to make us afraid and to intimidate us, and with me at least it was working pretty well. And I walked in there, and here's Desmond Tutu preaching. And just as he got into his sermon, they broke down the doors of the cathedral and, and, they, and they came in and they were South African security police and they were holding tape recorders and pads of paper and they were writing down everything he said. They were saying to him in effect, go ahead, Bishop. You be bold, you be powerful, you be prophetic. We're here because we own this country. We own this cathedral, we own you. We own your religion, we own your God. And he stopped preaching. We wondered what he would do. And he bowed his head for a moment and he just seemed to pray. And he looked up. And he looked at them from side to side. He says, you know, you're powerful. 
Very powerful, but you are not gods, and I serve a God who will not be mocked. Then he smiled at them, that great big Desmond Tutu smile that you've seen. The, you know, he looked kind of like Yoda, you know. He's, you know, little guy in long flowing robes. He smiles at them. He says, he says, he says, I love this. He says, so, he says, since you have already lost, don't you love that? Since you have already lost, and then began bouncing like a good Baptist preacher, we invite you today to come and join the winning side. And the young people, the young people jumped out of their seats and began dancing the toy toy, this chanting, stomping movement, and danced us out in the streets. And the police backed up. They didn't expect dancing worshipers. But we danced in the streets of South Africa. Ten years later, I was at the inauguration of Nelson Mandela, and guess who was the master of ceremonies? Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I said, Bishop, do you remember that day in St. George? Do you remember what you said and what you did? And he smiled. He remembered. I said, Bishop, today they've all joined the winning side because that day there wasn't one white person in South Africa who hadn't always been against apartheid. On that day, he taught me something, that this is the formula for change, faith that prompts hope. It creates action and it causes change. Faith, hope, action, and change. And then you have the party, the inauguration, or whatever it is, and it's great to be at the party for people of faith, but our job isn't at the party. It's back here at St. George's when you can only see the party through the eyes of faith. You say, there will be a party, and now I'll bet my life on the party. That's what happens, always has, always will, because my Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and that means to me, hope means believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. That's our job, that's your job, that's my job. Let's do it together. Thank you very much. <laughs>